Becky. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 3 John. 3 John. 1 John, 2 John, and then 3 John. Um, we'll do some prayer requests at the end of the service. Um, Jean Wallace is going to have carpal tunnel surgery this Tuesday, so pray for her. But um, I want to go ahead and mention this morning we need to pray for Elizabeth Cochran and her youngest daughter, Emily. Um, Elizabeth's oldest daughter, Linda, passed away this week. And um, I don't know how many of you remember Elizabeth. She, she was here for 100 years probably, but she moved a few years ago to Mississippi and then to Tennessee. And she lived with her youngest daughter, Emily. Her oldest daughter, Linda, had moved down to Naples, Florida. And um, she had worked at Lowe's for 19 years, and last Sunday she had a heart attack and then a brain bleed. And they kept her on life support all week because she was an um, organ donor, and so they unplugged her on Friday. And um, we tried to hook, hook her up with Josiah's soccer coach at Point because Linda called me and asked me, oh, em Emily called me and asked me if I knew anybody that needed an organ. That the Oregon donor people, donor people told them and said, if, if any of y'all know anybody that needs anything, we can move them to the top of the list. So Josiah and Levi and Nathan soccer coach Mark had, had went and tried to, to see if he was a match, but he was not. So she gave me this update yesterday and asked me to share it with y'all. A 71-year-old female and a 57-year-old female both successfully received a kidney from London. Um, and then they're going to use her pancreas and liver for research and to look for a cure. And then she said, this is the only info so far, so there may even be more come in at a later date, um, possibly. So pray for Elizabeth and Emily and, and the loss of their uh, daughter and sister, Linda. I, I had three jokes on my phone. I'm sitting down here in front of you trying to pick one out. I, while Becky's singing, well, this goes right along with her song. It, it says the the school of the the the, the school of agriculture's dean of admissions was interviewing a prospective student, and he said, "Why haven't you chosen? Why have you chosen this career? Why do you want to come to this school? Why have you chosen this career?" And he says, "I dream of making a million dollars in farming, like my father." The student replied, and the guy said, "Your father made a million dollars in farming." And he said, no, but he always dreamed of it. <laughs> but I'm not Miss Becky and Miss Inez Brock. Boy, we, what we, when, when Inez said, she used to say, Pastor, I'm a millionaire. She wasn't talking about money. Wasn't talking about money whatsoever. She was talking about her uh, free gift of salvation and her relationship with the Lord. The title of my message this morning is Three Men in the Church. This is taken from 3 John, the whole book, all 14 verses. We're going to work through it little by little as we go through this message. Uh, it could easily be entitled Three Women in the Church. But this happens to be three men in the church, but three women in the church the same way. We, we appreciate so much of, that so many in our church do to, to help us moving forward to share the gospel with this community. The church today is made up of many people of diverse backgrounds, and yet we are all one in Christ Jesus. Uh, there's not two of us here today that are just alike, and uh, aren't you glad that there aren't more than one of a lot of us? My wife loves me dearly, but I'm sure that she's glad there's not more than one of me. But of course, if you look at my four boys, there is four more of me. The church is made up of many different personalities, people of different characteristics, and yet we have one common bond in that we are one in Christ Jesus if we by faith place our trust in Him. Galatians 3, 28 and 3, 29 says this, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Praise God for this promise. If you belong to Christ, if you by faith accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then you are heirs according to the promise of God's Word. 
It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what color you are, what gender you are, what age you are, or even what country or state that you are from. If you belong to Christ, if you are saved, then we are all one in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter what your background is. We may have people here today that were saved when they were adults, some that were saved when they were teenagers, some that were saved as little children. Some of us may have been saved and walked with the Lord ever since. And praise the Lord for that. Some of us may have wandered away from the, from the Lord for a while, maybe even for many years. If, if you are saved and you have a wonderful testimony of God's grace in your life, you don't have to have a rough background of some awful experience to have a, an awesome testimony. The best testimonies that I know of are those who have walked with the Lord ever since the day of their salvation. And many of you can, can, can testify to that. But there are all types of people in the church today. Some may live to eat sweets. Other people could, could go without, could take them or leave them. There are all kinds of differences in people. You may be thinking of some right now about whoever's sitting right next to you. Some of us like to shop, mostly women. Some of us don't like to shop, mostly men. Some people like to go out to eat. Others like a good home-cooked meal. The, not too long ago, we went to Cracker Barrel to eat supper, and that was a mistake in the first place. You have to walk through a store to get in there, and you have to walk through a store to get out. All these pretty things that your wife can't, uh, can't resist, and, and if you ever notice, they've got the candy stationed right at the eye level for the little children that they'll see. Uh, but have you ever sat in a restaurant or at a ball game or at the mall or even at church and just looked at the people? God made every one of us distinctly different. We're all different in so many ways. Did you know that we're all one in Christ, even if we are a little different? Even if we might every now and then have a difference of opinion. Uh, we are still to love one another even if we're not just alike. God has placed all of us in this church here together to love one another, to edify one another, to serve and worship the Lord together, and most of all, to reach out to a hurting world with the good news of Jesus Christ. People that are different, people with different characteristics, different backgrounds, different opinions and ideas, and yet we are all one in Christ Jesus. The epistle of 3 John as a whole presents a vivid glimpse of church life at the close of the first century. And there are three personalities mentioned here in 3 John that were all part of the early church, three men. Gaius, Diotrephes, and Demetrius. And we're going to look at these three men today and see what type of what, what, what kind of people these were. So look with me at 3 John verses 1 and 2. The elder to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. As John wrote this epistle, he mentioned to Gaius in verse 2 that he prayed for him. He prayed for good health, and he also prayed for his soul to prosper. Uh, in what ways do we pray for our fellow church members? Uh, we're so faithful to pray for each other's physical needs, but what about praying for one another's spiritual condition? Uh, we pray for those that are lost that may have never accepted Christ as their personal Savior, but do we pray for our Christian friends that they will grow in their personal relationship with the Lord? Uh, this is so important that we pray for one another regarding spiritual matters and not just physical. We need to pray for each other that we will keep our eyes on the Lord and not get off track, and maybe allowing the things of the world to distract us from the things of the Lord. I would love to know that my church is praying for me in this manner, not just physically, but spiritually. So let's look at these three men in the church that John was writing about. We are writing about three men that were different and yet serving in the same church. First of all, he was addressing Gaius, 
who was a man in the church that was known to be faithful. And we could compare this to many in this church today, many of the men and women in this church today that are, that are absolutely faithful. Look at verses 3 and 4. It says, It gave me great joy to have some brothers come and tell me about your faithfulness to the truth and how you continue to walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. We live in a world full of deception. And we live in a world that's on fire. And that's the reason we want to plan over the next seven weeks to preach these messages toward asking God to send us revival. Well, Gaius was a man of faith. And Gaius was a man that had a solid foundation, a foundation built upon truth. A foundation built upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's no more uh, of a solid foundation anywhere than the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this. Does it give you joy to hear about or to witness the faithfulness of others? If so, we should tell them about it. We should build them up and edify our brothers and sisters in Christ by telling them how much we appreciate their faithfulness and all that they do for the Lord and for His church. Gaius had been faithful, and John had heard about it. If we are faithful, people will hear about it. It should not be the other way around, people talking to others when they hear of someone slipping and falling in their walk with the Lord. Have you ever had someone call you up and ask you, did you hear about how so-and-so was growing in the Lord? Or was it the other way around with them uh, telling you about something wrong in someone's life? They... They may have said, well, now, now this is not gossip. I just want you to, to be aware so you can pray for them. Uh, well, John must have been the, the spiritual father of Gaius like Paul was the spiritual father of Timothy. He had no greater joy than to hear that his children were walking in the truth. Our prayers for our children and for our grandchildren and for our church should be that we walk in the truth of God's Word. There's, there's so much untruth out there. So many religions and even cults that are misleading people away from the truth of the Bible. Uh, so much untruth everywhere you look. Uh, again, it says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Uh, the family unit is such an integral part of the church. Nothing is more important than making sure that our children are walking in the truth and our grandchildren. Parents and grandparents, it is our responsibility to ensure that our children and grandchildren are walking in the truth. It is our responsibility to bring them to church and to bring them to Sunday school where they can be taught from God's Word. It is also our responsibility to share with them from God's Word at home and to pray with them, are you praying for the salvation of your family members, especially those that are young, that may have not trusted in Christ yet? Now, are your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren old enough to understand the gospel and have the opportunity to ask Jesus to forgive them of their sins and to come into their life and to save them? Again, it says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Church, we can be from different backgrounds. We can have different uh, opinions on a lot of things, but we must not compromise on the truth found in God's room. But word, there's, there's no room for error. Look at verses 5 through 8. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. It was for the sake of the name, talking about Jesus, that they went out receiving no help from the pagans. We ought, ought, we ought therefore to show hospitality to such men so that we may work together for the truth. So again, John is building up Gaius, complimenting him on the way that he heard that Gaius had treated some missionaries that came through, uh, even though he did not even know them. Gaius was one that was given the hospitality, even to strangers. And I couldn't help as I studied this week to think about 
what's going on with our church and, and the possibility of possibly teaming up with the Bridge Church to, to share space and to have two churches meeting here instead of one. And it's not more, it's more so than just to, to collect rent, but for both churches to hopefully move forward in, in reaching the, this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, are we faithful and generous to all other believers, even if we don't know them? Even if they may be a little different than us, maybe even worship a little different than us. The last part of verse 8 says, so that we may work together for the truth. That is God's concept for the local church, that we work together and not that we go off in our own direction doing our own little thing. We must be united and work together in order to be effective in reaching the world for Jesus Christ. Gaius was a faithful man that walked in the truth. We should all be working together for the sake of the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now let's look at the second of these three men in the church. His name is Diotrephes. I don't know if you can say that three times real fast, Diotrephes. He's a little bit of a different fellow. Look at verses 9 and 10. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. So if I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, gossiping maliciously about us. Not satisfied with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Here Diotrephes was rebuked by John. Diotrephes was proud and self-seeking. He loved to be first. Have you ever known someone who loved to be first? There's no room for one like this on a team that is working together. We are to be united in Christ. And humility is the, the way in which Christ served and the way that we are to serve in His church. In Mark 10, 45, we see that Christ came to minister and to serve and not to be served or ministered to. It wasn't enough that Diotrephes wanted to be first, that he wanted to have all the attention, but he wanted to get there by putting down others. He was not only gossiping, but he was gossiping maliciously. There is no place for this kind of conduct in the church in God's house. Romans 8, 1 says, Therefore there is now no condemnation, for those who are in Christ Jesus. If we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and given His righteousness and there, and there is no condemnation whatsoever from the Lord, then it sure isn't right for us to be condemned or put down by others. And in the last part of verse 10, it says, Not satisfied with that, He refuses to welcome the brothers. Uh, this is the Lord's house, not ours. Uh, sometimes people think that if they give an offering to the church that they should uh, have a say-so and everything that goes on. But when we give our, if you think about it, when we give our tithes and offerings to the Lord, then we do exactly that. We give it away. It isn't ours anymore. We need to trust God more. I, I shudder to think about what's in store for someone like Diotrephes that would actually turn someone away from the church. It says here he refused to welcome the brothers. Uh, we should be careful to make sure that we are edifying the body of Christ, the local church, by loving one another and provoking one another to good works. Look at Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17. This is how we should conduct ourselves as a church. It says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. 
And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. If we all did this, then we wouldn't have anything to worry about. We are instructed here to forgive one another. Even as the Lord forgave us, you may say, well, but so-and-so hurt me. And we are still to forgive them. We are not to go about causing divisions in His church. Now, I'm not aware if there's any divisions among this congregation, but I do know people, and usually where you have people, you have people problems because we don't depend on the Lord to guide us through life like we should. Diotrephes was causing disunity within this local church. If we have an alt against a brother or a sister, the Word of God tells us to go to them and straighten it out. Yet, instead, we will go and tell everyone except that person, causing disunity within the body of Christ. In verse 11, it says, Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. In other words, we should be a faithful character like Gaius and not be like Diotrephes. How can we hold a grudge or have bitterness towards someone that Christ loved enough to lay down his life for? Think about that for a minute. God has forgiven them. Why can't we? Well, what does the outside world think when they look in and see those in the church not getting along? Uh, do you think that they want to know more about God? Of course not. Uh, Beth Moore said this. It, it really made a whole lot of sense. Listen to this quote from Beth Moore. It says, A world teeming with devils, and we again and again make enemies out of saints. That's how senseless that it can be if people in a church aren't getting along. Uh, have you ever known a Christian in the church who got their feelings hurt and quit coming to church? I, I know people that have not been to church in years because of getting their feelings hurt by someone. Well, we need to do all that we can to restore them into the fellowship of the local church. We need to do all that we can to get along and to love one another and to love the Lord. Let's talk about a third personality, a third man in the church named Demetrius. Demetrius. Verse 12 says, Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone and even the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. Demetrius had a sound reputation in the church, just like Gaius. He had a good report from, from others and was well spoken of by everyone. He walked in the truth just as Gaius did and just as we should. We should walk in the truth of God's word. We should love one another, edify one another, build each other up in the Lord. We should accept others, even if they have a little different personality than we do or a little different opinion uh, about something. We shouldn't despise one another when, all, after all, we are all one in Christ Jesus. So we should model ourselves after Gaius and Demetrius and not be like Diotrephes. Timothy is another one that we should strive to be like. Listen to these words in Philippians 2 from the Apostle Paul writing about Timothy. He says this, he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Timothy was one that Paul could count on. Uh, Paul says again, I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone else looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. I had to ask myself, which one of these two categories do I fit in? Uh, we can all be selfish at times if we're not careful looking out for number one. That's what, what the world teaches it. Look out for number one. We just need to put Christ as number one in our lives instead of ourselves and then others 
When we were little kids, we learned the little acronym JOY, J-O-Y, Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. God loves us unconditionally. He, he accepts us unconditionally. Do we love and accept others unconditionally? Or do we want something in return if we love someone? So, three men in the church, Gaius, Diotrephes, and Demetrius. Two good men to model ourselves after one that we should not. And John concluded this third chapter with verses 13 and 14. He says, I have much to write to you, but I do not want to do so with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace to you. The friends here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. As, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we ought to have a genuine desire to be together. As Paul yearned to be with these that he was writing to, let me ask you this. Do you look forward to coming to church and having fellowship with other believers? Uh, we are all children of God if we've trusted in Him. And He desires for us to worship Him together corporately as one in Christ. Even though we are a little different, even though we are many, we come together to worship Him as one. Can you imagine what it would be like to go through life without knowing the Lord? If you look around at the world and all the lost people that are falling for lies and, and, and not understanding the truth. Uh, I don't know how in the world they make it. We couldn't make it without having the Lord to lean on and trust and, and, and to draw strength from, to guide us through this life like we as Christians do. He, he chooses to do a lot of this through other believers that He has sovereignly placed us with. He desires to use other people in our lives to encourage us and to grow us closer to Him so that we may be an effective church and reaching the lost world with the good news of Jesus Christ. We are to be united so that we can be that white house on a hilltop, a beacon for those that are hurting and in need of a Savior. Three men in the church, three personalities, Gaius, Diotrephes, and Demetrius. Which of these should we pattern our lives after? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to look into your precious word. And Father, we just thank you that uh, we can see in, in this one church here in 3 John, uh, three examples, two good and one not so good, of how we should pattern our lives after. Well, we just thank you for our church, our church family, for each one here today, for each one uh, that, that, that can't come but still supports our church and so forth, maybe those watching online and and Lord, we just pray that we would all be one and realize that we are one in Christ Jesus. That even if we're a little different, that we should love one another. And Lord, I just thank you for the unity that I know for a fact is in this church and how this is the most loving group of believers that we've ever been around. And we just thank you for that. And thank you for the lesson that we can learn through this today. But we pray for our church as we move forward, especially for the next seven weeks, Lord. I just pray that that everyone in our church will be challenged to pray for our church for the next seven weeks, that you would send us a revival that would spread into this community and throughout this entire world. And we just thank you for loving us. In Jesus' sweet name we pray. Amen. Our invitation hymn will be hymn number 469. If you'll stand with me and we'll sing Revive Us Again.
today. But I hope you'll take this bulletin and serve and read it and not just put it, push it aside. Read it, give it to someone, but pray. Pray about our church and pray about the next few weeks that we ask the Lord to, to send us revival that can spark something in this community throughout this entire world. Much to pray about. It's so good to have Kay back with us. We continue to pray for her and Buddy as she recovers. Um, she needs our prayers. But she's doing great. She said even the doctor was bragging on That's wonderful. Buddy, <laughs> too. Um, continue to pray for Sally Robinson, for Harvey's wife, battling cancer. She has chemo again tomorrow. And then on Friday, uh, Harvey has to have more shots in his eyes. So pray for him as well. Um, Gene Wallace on Tuesday have a carpal tunnel surgery, outpatient surgery. Pray for her. Um, Becky's brother-in-law, Jim Saturday, is having surgery August the 15th. That's this week as well. Um, and then pray for Elizabeth Cochran and the loss of her daughter. Pray for Wade. I talked to Wade this week, and he's not been here in a few weeks. He's, he he's, can't get his sleep back to normal. He said he can't wake up in the morning. He can't go to sleep at night. So pray for Wade. He's really going to do a tough time. Um, who else do we need to pray for? Sa uh, um, Alice got a job at the Georgia Baptist Children's Home. Hallelujah. We've been praying for that for a long time. So pray for Alice. She'll, she'll be involved in ministry. That's not just working. That's ministry. That's ministry. So pray the Lord for that. So good to see Sonny and Patsy. Um, good to see you here and all of you. Any other prayer requests? Ma'am? Unspoken prayer requests for Buddy's uh, granddaughter. I know there's probably a lot of unspoken requests. Thank you. All right, we're going to close by singing God is so good. Thank you.